now I would like to yeah to invite the second keynote speaker from uh, University of Technology Malaysia uh, okay Professor Dr Muhammad Nazri bin Jaafar to give uh, his uh, presentation okay uh, before that I would like to introduce uh, Professor Nazri uh, some biodiversity uh, uh, Professor Nazri is a professor at the School of Mechanical Engineering University of Technology Malaysia he is currently the head of the gas turbine adventure research group he obtained both in Bachelor in Aeronautical Engineering 1986 and Master in Aerospace Engineering in 1989 from Michita University, University USA. Okay, Prof. Nazri obtained his PhD in 1997 in the field of combustion from the University of Leeds, the UK. He has extensive experience in academic administration as Dean of Transportation uh, Research uh, Alliance, Head of Aeron Aeronautical Laboratory, Head of Department of Aeronautical Engineering, Committee Members of National Aerospace Council, Chairman of UTM Book Panel, Chief Editor of Journal Mechanical, a member of the Advisory Committee for Aerospace Skill Development, and team members of the National Accreditation Board. At the international level, he is a member of the board of editor of the International Journal of Sustainable Aviation. So, so, so for not further ado, we will present you the uh, presentation from Professor Nadmi for the keynote, uh, second keynote. Good day to all the participants of the International Symposium on Sustainable Aviation uh, 2020 is actually held in the Stupitra Malaysia from the 9 to 12 of November 2020. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give this uh, keynote speech uh, to all the participants of the conference. First and foremost is to the chairman of the ISSA 2020, uh, my good friend, Professor uh, Dr. Abdul Rahim Talib, and I would also like to uh, thank to President of the SARES, which is Professor Hikmet Karapoish. Actually, this uh, international symposium on this international symposium on sustainable aviation (ISSA) I think has been held since the year 2015. Uh, I was intending to attend that meeting since then. Uh, because the attractive part of it is that because it's been held in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. But I think the timing wasn't very, you know, uh, it's not on, my, on our side, it's not on my side because it's at the end of the semester there, which we are actually very, very busy with the, you know, exam and also with the um, marks and also with all this uh, meeting. Uh, the next year also I think was held in uh, Turkey. And the same thing, the timing wasn't that good. And this is actually the first time after they have the five years. And thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I will also, I would like also to thank to Professor Dr. Noor Kamaria, who is the dean of this Faculty of Engineering, UT Putra Malaysia, and to Professor Dimke Doge Roglu. Director of the SK Seher Technical University, and not to forget the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Malaysia uh, for giving this opportunity for the conference to be held here in Malaysia. Okay, because this is on the sustainable aviation, my topic today will be on the fuel part because my research, my studies have been focus on the propulsion of the aircraft and then we move down to the combustion part uh, which is uh, where I did my uh, focus on my PhD and then finally now we are going more and more towards the biofuel 
this is the uh, you know the problem the, the problem is the fossil fuel and we start to focus first and foremost I did on the bio biodiesel and now we move towards bio biojet or what we call the biochem engine um, you can see on the slide that my name is uh, Muhammad Nazri Muhammad Jafar and uh, this is my research group this is just the commercial research group that's what I've been uh, doing uh, for the last uh, almost uh, 30 years of research why do you need it? you know? they ask go through some definition first and see the uh, what what do you mean by uh, by a few? Uh, this slide where we can break down into this uh, different part here. Yeah. Why we go for biofuel against this uh, fossil fuel? Fossil fuel are non renewable and they will be bound to deplete any time. Uh, they have been going for so long, but there will be time where it will come to an end. Whereas the biofuel is considered renewable as long as there are plants being planted and they can convert all those into biofuel, then the supply will not run out. Historical prices of crude oil since 1841 to 2014. There has been so many spike on the price of the oil. Uh, back in 1864, where the price is about 121 dollars 50 cents a barrel, this is caused by the Pennsylvania oil boom. Uh, oil boom. And then in 1920, where there is a first uh, fuel shortage in the West Coast, and then it goes up. In uh, 1974, due to the OPEC oil embargo and so on, the Iran revolution, and until today, I think the price has gone to 117 uh, in 2011 due to the Arab Spring. So that means that the price is actually fluctuating, going up and down, ever since. So you can see here, uh, this is this is uh, from the data we have. Is this is the last one. Uh, but this, uh, this time I think the price is actually dropping due to the COVID. The price of the, uh, of the fuel which is not stable, you can look at this um, graph that is being uh, produced here. Right up to 2015, you can see that all the production of this uh, energy resources or we call it fuel actually declining it's estimated up to 2035 you have a quite a major problem with the supply of this this fuel uh, this is where our biofuel will come into play because biofuel can actually be sustained if the plants are being planted uh, continuously So the third one is actually due to the emission. Uh, it's flying, it can uh, it produces actually a lot of uh, emission, including the noise, because noise is also uh, considered as an uh, emission. Uh, the first and foremost, you can see from the, uh, from this uh, picture, is the nitrate oxide. Okay. And then we also have carbon monoxide, particulate matter, we have carbon dioxide, and so on. So all of this cause a lot of problems with the health of the human being, asthma, and you can see here cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, if you burn uh, uh, the kerosene fuel, this is per ton of kerosene. Okay. And you can see that it depends on the operating condition, whether it is on the during takeoff or during cruising or during landing. So you give you a different uh, emission, altitude where you fly, okay, the humidity, and also the temperature. 
So all of these parameters will affect the production or the generation of all these emissions. So per ton of kerosene, you can see that this is a, a water vapor, about 1.24 ton. Carbon dioxide is 3.15, but I think that is the most that is being produced uh, by any combustion processes. And then we have this uh, uh, NOx, about 6 to 20 kilograms, then CO, FF soot, and SO2, and so on. And this is actually unburned hydrocarbon, call it uh, uh, or sometimes we call it uh, uh, THC, total hydrocarbon. Alright, so these are all actually the, uh, the emissions being produced during the uh, flight of the aircraft also including the uh, ground handling, taxi and so on. Okay. See here that the annual increase in the CO emission uh, by the aircraft is really 2% up until uh, uh, today. I think I think this one was done uh, quite early. I don't know, I don't have the actual date. But it is bound to increase by 5 to 10% annually by 2050 if there is no action being taken to reduce this kind of emission. So it's the main focus. Okay, so to all four atmospheric pollution. There is acid not the ozone depletion, global warming also for two chemical smog. Uh, we will not go into detail on all these things because this also will take uh, an hour of lecture which I have given before. Uh, we we'll just skip this one, I'm just saying that I think most of you here are already telling this this situation. Greenhouse gas also contribute to global warming and the very very important thing is that we cannot avoid CO2 because CO2 is the product of combustion. If you look at the combustion equation, where you burn the hydrocarbon fuel with oxygen, the product is actually uh, for the clean combustion. You say any emission is the CO2 and H2O. So we cannot avoid this one. It's being generated during uh, any combustion process. Breakdown of the NOx emission. Uh, throughout the world, I mean globally, and also by sector. You can see that in the legend here at the very bottom here, uh, transport is actually the green one. So transport include everything: the ground transport, air transport, and also the sea transport. Uh, okay, you can see most of the time the transportation sector contribute to the most of the emission everywhere. China, in the US, uh, even in the Europe or Asia for that matter. Country in 2014, the data is quite old, uh, but you can see the CO2 emission is uh, being produced by China 50%, United States 15 and the European Union uh, 9%, and the rest of the world is actually uh, 30%. Uh, these are the small things like Japan, Russia, and also India. Uh, so, that's to show how much uh, these countries are producing CO2. To also keep increasing throughout the years, uh, this data is uh, until 2017. The study has been done by Borden, Holland, and also Andreas. Um, they they uh, showed that the CO2 is actually uh, increasing from time to time and uh, this is uh, from the burning of fossil fuel. It's actually the breakdown of the greenhouse gas. You can see here carbon dioxide contribute to most of the Greenhouse gas, which is 65%, uh, carbon um, dioxide from uh, forestry. Uh, this is from the fossil fuel. Uh, this is from forestry and then methane and nitrous oxide. So this all comprise the uh, greenhouse gas. 
to be read down from them. Uh, mostly it's from the trucks, uh, and then the car, uh, and also the uh, heavy heavy trucks. You can see here the contribution of aircraft is about nine percent of the total. Uh, even though it's not that much, if you can really consider uh, the rest of the other transportation uh, vehicles, but the major thing with this aircraft is that it deposits the emission directly into the stratosphere. So this we have to be careful because it can uh, deposit all this emission directly up there. Because the rest of the emission being generated here takes time to move to the stratosphere. They will dissipate uh, to the time. Uh, maybe going up there, the emission is being reduced or being uh, diluted. But from the aircraft, even though it's only 9%, but the emission that has been uh, generated is actually very, very dangerous. Of course, the uh, ozone depletion, global warming, and so on. The fuel is that it is renewable as we see this now. Because we, if you uh, keep on planting all those trees, then we can uh, use the oil and we can produce uh, biofuel. That we have to understand it, how it closes the carbon cycle. Because the one that is generated by the, all these uh, vehicle or transportation that we're talking about just now, the CO2 will actually be taken up by the plants. Okay? So to the photosynthesis, they will actually, uh, I mean, uh, produce oxygen and send it back to the uh, atmosphere. And also the plant we can use to get the oil and we can produce the uh, biodiesel, biofuel, and so on from this process and be used back. But if you use the fossil fuel, all those CO2 being generated will not be uh, taken back. Alright? So it will be accumulating into the atmosphere. Uh, that is different. So if you use bio, biofuel, it will take back the uh, CO2 into the plant. Okay. Sustain. We have, can have a sustainable supply of fuel and it also is environmental friendly. See, it's booming. You cannot avoid that. Okay? Because people are traveling using aircraft. Popular and growing business as more and more choose to travel by air. The easiest mean, the fastest mean. Uh, that you can travel within hours to get from one point to the other. Uh, I think if you uh, travel from uh, Kuala Lumpur to uh, LX, I think it will take you about 20 plus hours. If I'm mistaken, because I haven't traveled to US for quite a long time already. Uh, that's how fast it is. And then, if you remember, we have the supersonic jet before. Uh, we call it SST, supersonic transport, Concord, and the, uh, it can move very, very fast. Okay. Okay. Uh, in 2015, the worldwide aircraft, what? Aircraft fleets are reported to be around 18,000 aircraft and the number is forecasted to continue growing up to 33,000 in 2035. Okay, travel volume has promoted improvement of operational service, further integrated instruments to integrated automation, engine efficiency is, and so on, and also for the distant, short and also for the long haul. References for all the, the points uh, before. Historical um, 
development or evolution of major aircraft you can see that in the uh, this part of the time uh, around uh, the 70s 80s and 2000 the development of the aircraft uh, is very very fast I mean uh, very very uh, rapid uh, moving from single aisle to uh, two aisles jet uh, white body and so on uh, from propeller to also jet you can see here uh, that's why the consumption of the fuel is actually uh, increase because of the uh, you can see here like say uh, example here like the Airbus or Boeing 747 is, is very big it's huge and it's very heavy so all this will cause the fuel to increase because to fly this kind of aircraft you need more fuel and basically these are all long haul uh, aircraft you can go very far and very long so they need to carry a lot of fuel and they burn also a lot of fuel the engine while not indulge in this one too much we start off with a piston reciprocate if you remember in 1903 is uh, the first milestone where the aircraft that is powered by the engine and can be controlled has a, uh, has a been flown in Kitty Hawk small town in uh, South Carolina and uh, this is a uh, evolution until then where we have the turbo jet engine and then it moved to turbo fan and so on until uh, today okay. basically uh, the aviation fuel is the kerosene type they call it okay and the most famous or most popular one is Jet A1 and also Jet A. Uh, Jet A is only in USA. We will, we will talk about it later. Alright, so it's used for civil aviation, for turbo jet, and also turbo prop and turbo fan. Uh, this is another one, we call it Jet B, which is the mixture of kerosene and gasoline. Half gas is basically used for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, piston engine, I mean for uh, uh, piston prop and so on and they have more gas and now we are focusing on this kerosene, bio kerosene uh, which can be used for both civil and also for military uh, but at the moment the bio kerosene is not used uh, 100% they are actually blended with kerosene in small percentages we will do that later all right okay. get so most of it is actually natural gas then we have distillate we have gasoline here because this is being consumed so much the, the the one that we use for aircraft is here i mean for the jet engine which is about 1.76 uh, percent only all right uh, okay Uh, aviation kerosene uh, which is Jet A and Jet A1 what is the difference? Uh, the difference is that the Jet A1 use uh, only outside the America so in America or United States they use Jet A right uh, and Jet A is not available outside America so it has a higher maximum freezing point allowing incorporation of broader installation cut uh, components this is uh, this is because uh, at the time I think due to the price of the oil also where USA uh, they produce their, their own uh, fuel we call it Jet A right this is the difference between Jet A and Jet A1 uh, quite similar in every aspect uh, one of the major difference is actually the freezing point where Jet A1 actually have a much lower uh, freezing point biofuel uh, there are several advantages of using this biofuel uh, it burns cleaner than fossil fuel resulting in fewer emissions as we mentioned up above that we have a closed carbon cycle there 
and because it doesn't have sulfur, so the sulfur dioxide also being uh, reduced. Uh, being reduced. So biofuel also free from sulfur content. And the other good thing is that it's biodegradable. In the preparation of this uh, aviation biofuel, they, they have this uh, several methods here, which is common. Uh, the alcohol to jet synthesis paraffinic kerosene, ATGSPK, we have the synthesized isoparaffin, we have a hydroprocess ester and uh, fatty acid synthetic paraffinic kerosene, HEPA, SPK, and the Fisher Top. Uh, there are also another one, uh, the different type of Fisher Top. It, this is up to 2012. A lot of countries, a lot of airlines has already started. Uh, producing this biojet. So each country have their own uh, preferences uh, and also each aircraft has actually uh, tested this uh, biofuel, I mean uh, biokerosene on board of the aircraft. So you can see from this uh, particular graph, I mean particular table, uh, most of the time or the maximum it can be used actually has been tested is actually about 50%. Uh, they don't go more than 50% of the biojet. Uh, the rest actually are uh, the, the, the normal kerosene. So this row, uh, this column show us the type of its stock being used. So you can see here a lot of airline also tested on the uh, used cooking oil. I mean that the one they use for cooking and then you want to throw them away, they re reprocess it and make it into bio kerosene. This is good uh, actually, uh, this is actually sustainable. You solve a lot of problem. Uh, problem of uh, how to dispose of this, this cooking oil. Uh, you take it back and you produce it into bio, bio kerosene. Uh, this is the thing that being tested back right here. You say one uh, example, thin air. Uh, they use a uh, um, uh, 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 use cooking oil. Uh, this is the uh, uh, call it flight it's from Amsterdam to Helsinki. Okay, uh, the number is only one flight. Okay, uh, and then we have like Air France from Toulouse to Paris also use uh, use cooking oil. Etihad here use also use cooking oil one flight from Seattle to Abu Dhabi. They also use jet of fire. You can see uh, Interjet use jet of fire about 27 percent here. Uh, one flight also from Mexico City to Tuxla Guineas. Okay, so these are all the example of how uh, no, I mean um, what type of is not being used and where you they use it. Okay, so most of this airline here can be the least here have already uh, used bio kerosene uh, as the type of uh, vegetable oil. So now that's why we come in our group, Gaston Bio Commercial Research Group. We studied on a different type of stock that is common with our region. Chose palm oil and coconut oil okay the production of the uh, this oil globally okay this is in Tonsic we have like 29 percent is from palm and then we have uh, this is soya uh, rapeseed uh, sunflower and also uh, others so you can see that palm oil is uh, produced a lot here so 29% 20, of the world oil production here. Yeah. So that's why we can utilize this uh, palm oil as a bio -kerogen. Palm itself, we have the palm kernel, we have the mesocarp and so on. You can use for our bio, bio jet. You can see here, uh, you can use also the, uh, the coconut uh, flesh. country producing uh, palm oil oh no coconut oil okay so you can see philippines is the largest 
for this two of coconut and then we have Indonesia we have India, Vietnam and so on so we can get our sources from here yield per hectare so from here you can see the pump give us the highest yield uh, per hectare per year so that means you can get a lot of oil from there within a small or within a same size of land compared to the rest action from coconut oil uh, because I will tell you why we focus on coconut oil rather than palm yeah, I will show you the result that we have done uh, for the last uh, we started I think in 2016 or 17 so for the last 4 or 5 years that we have already doing this uh, uh, research on Biogen Kerosene or sometimes they call it by kerosene, sometimes they call it Biogen uh, it depends uh, I think Biogen is easier to to I mean, uh, to say rather than bicarbonate, which is a bit longer. But bicarbonate is uh, re referring to the comparison of it. Like say by diesel compared with diesel, so bicarbonate should be the one we use because it compare us to the kerosene fuel used for aircraft. Uh, by kerosene, uh, of kerosene over the petrol uh, where they have a higher flash point and so on, higher density and so on ok, we are not going to the uh, industry system too long also some properties which is very very important so when we going to produce our biojet or biokerosene again so this will be our main focus, we have to look at all these uh, properties so that these properties we have a very similar properties to kerosene from fossil fuel that has been used in aircraft for so long so if the quality of all these properties did not meet the uh, minimum requirement so it cannot be used as a biojet so we have a viscosity volatility as the um, what we call it uh, other properties of concern there's a list, a long list of it uh, we have to show you here at the moment uh, there are actually four most common types used to produce biokerosene and then they have alcohol to jet, ATG gas to jet, also sugar to jet so in our case we focus on this oil to jet because we use oil from the vegetable or from plant like palm and so on we convert them into uh, jet fuel which is uh, by kerosene you can also use uh, the waste cooking oil or you call it use cooking oil because that also is in the form of oil so we use this uh, process we call it hefa which is hydro process ester and fatty acid all right is it we use thermal catalytic cracking so we need to use some catalyst to enhance the production so the process is called deoxygenation where we can actually play around with these three parameters here temperature catalyst and pressure so we can have a different product if you use let's like, say different catalyst then the yield will be different and then the properties will be different uh, the carbon number that we get also will be different from the one that uh, produced by using different uh, catalysts okay so actually the path being taken the two main routes which is the carboxylation and also the carbonylation so both of them actually will happen uh, according to the uh, condition all right they will produce uh, all this uh, product here straight and branch alkene and alkenes aromatic and so cycloalkenes i'm not going to this too deep because this is a lot of chemistry here we use only we already um, focus or interested in the 
and product uh, these two are being used chosen for our test at the moment we will um, study further on other oil later but uh, for the current case study we take these two uh, oil as our uh, in, uh, we'll call it pilot, pilot study to produce the catalyst also I will not involve uh, too much in this one because this uh, uh, is not our area we have to consult uh, chemists and so on so they will produce this uh, maybe we will try like um, producing a different catalyst later on by the moment this is what we are using alumina type okay so this up come to almost around 80 percent of hydrocarbon also two and a half hour is actually the limit if you push further up to three hours or so uh, you will not yield further all right so that means that duration time has its limit also but again i would like to remind that this is only true for the catalyst we use if you run another catalyst it might give us a different uh, result okay take up the catalyst loading so that means that about four or about five percent is actually our limit okay if you go further than five percent and we are not going to get any further uh, increase in the hydrocarbon view so actually <coughs> this study is actually on still ongoing why because it's being disrupted by the COVID situation so all the testing has to be stopped and then as we start back in June it will slow down, slow down because of the collision and then all our results are actually bottleneck in the uh, lab analysis lab actually we send out for analysis and until today uh, we cannot get our result of the analysis because the queue is too long and the COVID caused it um, to stop for a while I think about two months and then now when they start back the list is actually increasing so that's why we cannot have a further result uh, on the properties other properties we will get and at the moment we are already producing a lot more of this oil but we can characteristic so later on we would like to indulge ourselves in the other oil jetropa because we have jetropa in our lab and we have the crude oil and we also have the biodiesel oil to produce and we also have used cooking oil so this will be our next uh, uh, our next uh, uh, work a study okay and the important thing is that uh, these two oils are actually non-edible they give more advantage for us to uh, work on these two we produce the biojet so where do we test it okay we need to test it somewhere we cannot use it on the aircraft because no airline will allow us to do that so we don't have any uh, equipment to do that so what we have to do is we have to build ourselves so what we do micro gas turbine in our lab and of this uh, micro gas turbine actually the micro gas turbine we developed is actually from a turbocharger you can see a turbocharger so what we did is actually this part here the combustion chamber part all right so this is our uh, design um, combustor this is the fuel injector I will call it the outer casing and this is the inner casing of the micro gas the component you can see here uh, during the process uh, flame tube and combustion chamber housing actually a uh, uh, lower industry together this is what we get okay so the temperature will go on the side and then the, this is the combustion chamber so the gas will be moving back here to you know to run the turbine. 
so we control uh, panel here they can also monitor the uh, pressure and temperature at certain point all right so these are all being designed and developed uh, in our lab here we managed to get the uh, flame here so that means that it's being is burning actually it can burn and we can test the fuel all right this in large quantity so we cannot test it on the biojet yet but to, to make sure that the microgas turbine is in uh, working order what we do we use the biodiesel using because we, the the microgas turbine was also developed to run biodiesel uh, uh, not only on bio biojet important thing that we already establish that this microgas turbine is workable so later on when we get our bio kerosene uh, ready we we'll blend it with uh, kerosene and we we'll test it on this so that is our uh, study uh, to show to share with the rest uh, I would like to thank this uh, 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 entity and also the you know uh, people involved. Uh, the fuel production we have the fundamental research grant scheme, title optimization study of conversion of trigas right to kerosene type emission fuel via catalytic deoxidation method. Uh, as you know, this is a FRGS scheme is already from the uh, Ministry of Higher Education uh, they give us uh, money every year uh, we have to apply for it actually they don't give it that idea <laughs> okay and then for the micro turbine also from Ministry of Higher Education so under the prototype research grant scheme so micro gas turbine capable of utilizing various liquid fuel so actually I got all both grant in 2017 and we managed to actually uh, get both of them to work. I mean, we managed to get the very jet and we managed to come up with this micro gas turbine. So, thanks to the Ministry of Higher Education for giving us the opportunity to develop this thing and we can use it when we can actually uh, study further. Okay, we can use study different feedstock and also we can study different catalysts. So we can vary a lot of parameters. Actually, there's a lot of studies can be done. That's why I'm uh, giving the opportunity here for those who haven't had the you know, PhD yet, uh, any participant out there who are interested to do this kind of research, they are welcome to come to UC Technology Malaysia. They can, can contact me and also you can you know apply for uh, the postgraduate study. Uh, we have this uh, uh, thing going on in our lab at the gas turbine, uh, at the gas turbine commercial research group. Lab. And also, I'd like to thank uh, these two students who helped me uh, because they are both under these uh, two projects. The one is to do the micro gas turbine, and the other one doing on the uh, Miss Anis here is doing on the bio jet. So, thank you again for listening. Thank you very much, and uh, have a very good day. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Nazri from UTM, for the presentation of the biofuel. So now I open the screen for Q&A session. Perhaps I can have several questions. You can ask from through my and also the chat. Huh? Thank you. I open the uh, I open the screen now. Oh. Uh, by the way, uh, first and foremost, I would like to apologize for the quality of the sound in the beginning of the recording. Actually, I want to do the recording in DTM, but suddenly uh, we are not allowed to enter DTM starting the 1st November, so that's why I have to do it at home using the PowerPoint recording. So, luckily at towards the end, the quality of the, you know, the audio quality is a bit better. Okay, if there is any uh, question, you can ask. Okay, there is one question, Prof. Uh, in there. All right. Uh, uh, okay. 
Biodiesel is actually uh, for the diesel engine. It's more on the metal, metal ester type. Uh, you can use it on the gas turbine. Uh, you can use it for gas turbine, but for power generation, not for aircraft. Uh, for the aircraft, you need to use uh, bio kerosene or uh, sometimes we call it biojet. Uh, so that is a major difference. Uh, but both are considered as biofuel. Okay, any other question? Uh, oh. Okay, regarding the best blend ratio, it depends on the quality of the fuel. If you manage to produce the fuel, uh, when you compare the bio kerosene with the normal kerosene or the jet, jet A or jet A1, if they are very similar in properties, you can use it 100%. But at the moment, people use it in blend because uh, the cost of production for these biofuels are still expensive compared to the fossil fuel. Okay, uh, maybe uh, the line is not really good from the uh, professor side. So maybe we can, you have, if you have a question, you can just uh, put it into, into the chat. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dr. Izani, yeah, maybe you can proceed with uh, the question. Yeah, um, I, I have a couple of questions that, um, are related to the presentation. Uh, Prof Nazri, uh, you're back. He's muted. I think uh, we have to unmute him. Uh, Prof, I think you are muted. Can you unmute your microphone? All right. Okay, there you go. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So, the line is not very good here. Yeah. I told Prof Rahim, actually that's why I didn't do the live presentation. I did the recording so that uh, it can be yeah. continuous, you know. But now I don't have the uh, lights keep coming and going, you know, just like uh, they call it a biscuit Oreo, you know. <laughs> uh, sometimes oh. good, sometimes good. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Izani, you have a question? Maybe you can ask Prof about the uh, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I, I have a few questions, but uh, out of respect for the uh, internet connection, I, I will try to break them up into small questions. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Don't give the, one long one. We can yeah, write it down, you know. The, yeah. the first one has to do with um, what you just mentioned uh, in terms of the energy cost and uh, monetary cost of production. Um, I think that, yeah, I remember, uh, yeah. that, that that's actually um, a, a very interesting piece of analysis that I think that uh, biofuel uh, producers um, actually have to be a bit more transparent about um, in terms of the production. Um, do, you, do you have any more comments about like the, the energy cost relative to the emissions benefit for using uh, biofuel? Uh, we don't have the, I mean, the data for that. But as I mentioned earlier in the slide that is uh, they call it, uh, call, it, uh, call it zero carbon cycle. So whatever emission that been produced mostly will go back to the plants that will take it up, you know, for the next um, uh, production. So it close the, the 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 carbon loop compared to the uh, compared to the fossil fuel. I mean, the, for the fossil kerosene. Uh, in terms of a real uh, that. Uh, compared like apple to apple, we don't have it at the moment. It might be, uh, it might be already there somewhere, but I don't have to look it up. Uh, in terms of energy, it's a bit lower because when we use a bio type, you know, any bio type, uh, most of the time the energy will be a bit or slightly lower than the fossil one. Even the biodiesel bio, bio also, if you compare it with uh, the fossil diesel, uh, the energy actually is a bit lower. Uh, so that is uh, the question, that, uh, to answer the question. Uh, I see there's uh, one uh, question from Ahmad Dairi. Uh, how long it will take to reach high technology level? Uh, for the rest of the world, I think they're already ready. If you look at the slide, uh, most of them are ready since 2012. It started in 2008 or 2009. 
and they already uh, proven that their quality of biojet can be used. Some of them, I showed you one uh, one table just now. They have done actually a uh, real flight, you know, and they get, they use up to fifty percent, but they shelf it at the moment because the price there is is uh, still high. In Malaysia, we are still doing it. Uh, so I'm not saying that we are not capable of doing them, but we can do it. But it takes time because we don't have enough, you know, facilities, research grant, and so on. Hopefully, if we can get more research grant, and then maybe inshallah, we try to, you know, expedite. But you have to go for small. I have to go for large scale production, and we cannot do that in our lab. We can do it very small. That's why I'm saying that we still have yet to test the, you know, the biojet on our develop, I mean, the one that we've fabricated the, you know, micro gas turbine. We'll try to do it then, uh, in due time. But again, if you see that the, <laughs> the problem with uh, COVID until today, you know, a lot of things cannot be, you know, cannot be done. Everything will stop, I mean, delayed and so on. Okay, any other okay. question? Okay, uh, maybe uh, can session chair ask the question a <laughs> bit because it's very interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, according <laughs> to the Ahmad uh, telling me, uh, if if we can develop uh, biofuel, we we, 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 uh, we which is we are not using fossil anymore, is it government yeah, yeah. will allow it? Uh, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> so how about the economy? Uh, if you look at the diesel engine, even at today's standard, the government is pushing for B30, if, you are, if I'm not mistaken. They're using B20 now for the diesel engine. So they will be pushing for B30, I think, for, for the next, uh, what do you call it, term, you know, like the RMK and so on. Uh, it's not impossible if we can, you know, try to uh, sell our commodity like uh, palm oil, uh, if you can produce uh, this biojet from palm oil, then I think uh, the government will allow them. At the moment, uh, I tested with the current catalyst, it looks like the coconut is more, much more vulnerable. So later we will try again, maybe using a different type of catalyst. Maybe we will try to, you know, push forward the palm oil, which is our commodity that we can sell, you know. Uh, let me see, I see there's another question from uh, Ah, the melting point of coconut is about 16 degrees I think uh, it is viable It is viable when we, we change them into biokerosene In the current form, it cannot be used That's why we have to go through the process of this uh, uh, Converting the coconut oil into the biojet uh, there is another question by Lim Chi Ho. Uh, thank you. Is there any plan to test biofuel using our local airline industry? <laughs> yeah, that would be my, you know, my pleasure to do that. But at the moment, I think we have to show some uh, result first to them. Uh, that's why I will, I will use our uh, small gas turbine that will be developed in our lab. And we have to run a lot of tests before we can, you know, actually convince our local, uh, our colleagues, uh, alliance to test them. Okay, is there is some more, is it? Uh, yeah. How you see the viability of Bioja in solid rocket propulsion? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not really uh, sure how to answer this. Uh, it can be used if you use uh, like a hybrid or dual fuel, you know, for the rocket propulsion. Uh, I'm not doing rocket propulsion anymore, so I might want to skip answering that question if it's, uh, it's okay with you. <laughs> okay, there's uh, another question. What are the most important physical properties which affect the engine uh, performance? Uh, one of the things is that the, the properties of the Fuel is that uh, is uh, viscosity. Because viscosity is very important when you want to uh, when you want to uh, use them in the aircraft. We have a problem of uh, how to pump the the oil, uh, the fuel. 
Oh, sorry. Ya. Uh, Prof, maybe we can allow ah. for last uh, one last question from the audience uh, before we. Ah, just, okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Is there uh, any question? Yeah, oh. so I saw one more from Yazan, Yazan El Tarazi. What do you rely on to select the fixed stock? Okay, uh, that's a good question. So basically, at the moment, because we go by our, I mean by our what we produce. Uh, for Malaysia, I think the best is actually palm oil. Uh, we try palm oil, but from our current uh, testing, it's not very uh, promising because the because of the catalyst we use. So I'm not giving up on that one. So we'll try again using a different type of uh, uh, what do you call this uh, catalyst. And hopefully, it's the catalyst that we are going to you know use later on. We give us a high yield of this uh, what do you call uh palm oil uh from uh, bio bio from palm oil uh that's why if you look at my last year slide i mentioned i'm going also to yeah. use the chapotra uh what huh? ah, chapotra and also this uh the and use uh, uh cooking uh, oil use cooking mm -hmm. oil yeah so that, that is much better because it doesn't uh what do you call it con uh, conflict with the edible edible oil so that might be our you know, next uh, next set of study okay uh thank you prof i think uh so so that uh, thank you very, very much oh, yeah <laughs> it's very to, very interesting subject it's good both for the again, uh, uh, yeah. i think dr shakarin is our uh, you know i <laughs> student in UTL. so he's my lecturer so yeah, I will yeah. not ask <laughs> him. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, so I right, think uh, the time is uh, now to try uh, up, uh, up, <laughs> up to the limit. Um, so with that, uh, I will pass the session to the MCA, Dr. Salah, to, to continue the session. Thank you, okay, uh, thank you for me. Okay? All right. Dr. Salah, thank can you. you just... All right. right. So uh, thank you very much for... Uh, I would say very fruitful sessions, our keynote speeches from Professor Hikmet Karakoc and also Professor Dr. Muhammad Nazri. I hope there will be a recording somewhere because uh, I would like to see, see and hear this uh, again. Um, uh, for your information, uh, today's uh, program ends here. We will adjourn uh, our program tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m. Malaysian time. So Malaysian time is GMT plus eight. So you can plan your um, uh, schedule from uh, where you are. But in the morning uh, at 9 to 10 a.m. Malaysian time, we'll have a keynote address from Professor Technologist Shamsul Kamar Abu Sama from the National Aerospace Industry Coordinating Office, NICO of Malaysia. And also um, a keynote address um, from technologist Ricky Liu Chi Leong from SR Aviation with the title, The Legal Requirements, Challenges and Issues of Aircraft Noise Reduction. So those two, uh, uh, we, our keynote address is tomorrow morning, uh, Malaysian time, 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. And also please be ready for, our, uh, for all our presenters. We will start our um, sessions um, uh, presentation at 11 a.m. Malaysian time. Uh, and it will continue until 6 p.m. Malaysian time. So you can uh, check the schedule in the website, ISSC 2020. Uh, I hope oh, you can check your schedule, which um, uh, time slot you are assigned in. And um, for now, I think uh, we will uh, end our program today with um, a few videos that we want to show um, everyone. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. I would like to probably ask uh, Dr. Muhammad Faisal to uh, show us some of these videos. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah
is all for today uh, Prof Rahim do you want to say anything just to close the program today and continue tomorrow okay um, thank you very much Dr Salahuddin for this yeah. uh, excellent uh, chairing of the session opening goes to keynote one and two thank you very much to Dr Azmin and Dr Faisal for uh, handling the keynote session and my uh, heart welcome and a thank you to Professor Hikmat he's still here until the end of day one and uh, and also my good friend professor nazri so i'll be we will be seeing you guys again tomorrow morning or tomorrow very morning in turkey <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so we will uh, try to have the video recording and uh, we will post uh, for those who miss it you will be able to see it uh, later right so we'll see you guys again tomorrow for more exciting presentation thank you and assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Welcome, salam. Assalamualaikum. see you all of you bye 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 <laughs> thank you thank you and see you